Hi, I'm Rebecca Gilling, and apart from my work on television, I'm also an alpaca owner. If you were standing here in the Domain in 1858, you'd have found yourself in the midst of a herd of 200 grazing alpaca. They were brought here by Charles Ledger, who had high hopes of establishing an industry based on superb fibre like this. Sadly, a combination of politics, a powerful merino lobby and a lack of husbandry skills saw the animals dispersed to zoos and farmers. There was even a public sale in the Melbourne Botanic Gardens, so their potential was never developed. Australia had to wait another 130 years to renew its acquaintance with this extraordinary animal, the alpaca. In 1990, the Australian alpaca industry began under much more favourable circumstances. This time, the government developed protocols to allow the importation of breeding stock from Chile. In the same year, the Australian Alpaca Association was formed and has rapidly progressed to become one of the strongest and most sophisticated organisations in the emerging rural industries. Alpaca breeders in Australia today can have as few as two or as many as several hundred animals. This is a larger property. Many of the animals here are either managed on behalf of investors or owners who are building up their herd with a plan to move to their own property on retirement. Breeders have the choice between two types of alpaca, the wakaya and the suri. The wakaya are the better known type. Their fleece grows pretty much like a sheep's, straight out from the body. And as you can see, they develop a crimp in their staples. The suri are much rarer. There are only a few hundred in Australia. They're similar to the wakaya in conformation, but as you can see, the fleece is totally different. Suri fibres are grouped in locks, which hang down in spirals, with more luster than the wakaya and no crimp. Other than that, you manage them in the same way. And what are they like to be around? Well, they're quiet and gentle, and they're really quite bright. What's more, they don't get fly strike or foot rot, and they don't have to be mulesed or crutched as they're clean skinned under the tail. They don't test fences or ring bark trees. You don't need a dog to round them up. You just walk behind them, a quick hand clap, and they'll head for the nearest open gate. Foxes aren't a worry either. Alpaca are very protective of their young, so much so that some sheep farmers are using alpaca weathers to protect flocks in lambing season. Just as they're kind on their owners, they're better for the land than other farm animals. They have a padded foot that doesn't erode the soil in summer or bog it up in winter. They also do well on native grasses and are efficient converters of energy, so you get more out of improved pastures as well. And they live a long, productive life into their 20s, which is a bit different from sheep and cattle. I've never done any shearing, but I'm determined to give it a go. Once you get the hang of it, shearers say they're no harder than sheep. They use the same equipment, although running at a lower speed because having less lanolin in the fibre, the blades tend to run hotter. And you don't need any special farm setup or equipment to run alpaca. Standard fencing works well, and as long as they've got some trees, hedges or shelters in the paddocks for those very hot days, or where you get icy winds and rain, they're fine. They might look delicate, but they're remarkably hardy. When it comes to breeding, it's surprising how much easier it is than with other stock. Because for a start, they don't have breeding seasons. They're induced ovulators. The female is mated 14 to 21 days after giving birth. Once she's pregnant, she rejects the male's advances by spitting him off. So pregnancy is easy to diagnose. A vet usually does a follow-up ultrasound to confirm. The gestation lasts 11 to 11 and a half months, and the crea, as the young are called, are nearly always single births. And one great advantage is that although there might be the occasional birth late in the afternoon or early morning, it's very rare to have a birth at night, and most are between 10 and 11 in the morning. Very convenient. 
Surviving in harsh environments like the Andes taught them that birthing early in the day is important to the well-being of the Kriya. But they're not entirely self-sufficient. There is a bit of maintenance required. They need a five-in-one vaccination twice a year, toenails are trimmed at regular intervals, and they need monitoring for parasites. So they're a wonderful farm animal, easily managed and easy to love. All the same, it's reassuring to know there's plenty of industry support for breeders. You're a handsome boy, aren't you? The Australian Alpaca Association runs a breed registry, keeps its members informed through a magazine and newsletter, runs education seminars around Australia, and perhaps most importantly, is involved in all facets of marketing and promotion to support breeder sales. There are alpaca classes at major agricultural shows around the country, and the association runs information stands at these shows. Each year, the association runs its own national alpaca show and elite classic auction, which in recent years have drawn thousands of prospective owners to be exposed to all aspects of the industry. Importantly, there are 14 breeder regions around the country, supported by the association, and these regions run alpaca events in their local areas. But perhaps the most frequently asked question about the alpaca industry is what about the end product? It's important to realise that first and foremost, we're a stud stock industry and breeders will make money from breeding for a long time before we have enough animals in the country to satisfy demand for fibre. This is in contrast to some alternative farming industries which haven't focused on the end product until they've gone through boom and bust cycles. The alpaca industry is very aware that for its long-term success, alpacas must produce a viable and profitable end product. We're committed to becoming a fibre industry. It's a, a luxurious fibre which means it's rare, it's got great value and quality connotations to it and it has wonderful softness and handle to it. It drapes beautifully, as you can see here. This is baby alpaca. It can be worn next to the skin. It has a lovely softness to it. It's also got wonderful strength, which means it wears well. It doesn't pill as readily as a lot of fibres, and therefore it's got the best of both worlds. It's got glamour, softness and strength. In fact, it's been used to make anything from a wedding dress to a doona.
What a fabulous show. That's the kind of promotion the Australian alpaca industry is staging today. And it shows how impressed international designers are with the possibilities of alpaca fibre. Of course, alpaca products have been in use for centuries, starting with the Incas, who used it to make robes for their royalty and called it the fibre of the gods. Many years later, alpaca was held in high regard by Europeans as a most beautiful fibre. Not only fine, but long-lasting, as these garments made in the 1940s demonstrate. These are just some of the clothes featured in the parade. And as you can see, alpaca is a fabulous fibre. It's soft and silky to handle, and it has superb thermal properties. Alpaca can be dyed, but unlike any other fibre, it comes in a beautiful range of natural shades, from pure white and cream, through fawn, browns, shades of grey from gunmetal to rose grey, and finally black, the only black fibre that doesn't need to be dyed. Processed to knitwear, it holds its shape and has a tendency not to pill, and one of its great advantages is that it doesn't have that prickle factor. Woven, it has a beautiful luster and is used to make superb coats, dresses and suits and makes a lovely complementary blend with wool, cashmere, silk and even cotton. The Suri fleece has another advantage. It will produce a cloth with a pile of different lengths. Some even see it as the logical replacement for animal skins and dub it the green fur. Quite simply, it is a dream fibre for any designer. So is it any wonder the industry is considered here to stay? An indication of that is the solid infrastructure in place to support breeders. With 200 years of experience in the production of merino wool, it's not surprising Australians have been quick to realise the exquisite nature of alpaca fibre and its commercial opportunities. In 1995, the Alpaca Cooperative was formed. Its purpose is to collect, process and value add alpaca and share the profits back to the grower. What was the purpose in forming the co-op? The co-op was formed by a group of members to ensure the future of the alpaca industry in Australia by producing a range of value added products that would be competitive on the world market. So what's the range of products? At the fine end of the range, we're producing smaller products to make the fine fibre go further. We, we do not have the, the amount of fibre we need to do big things. However, we're having quite success with fine knitwear and working on a joint venture on luxury socks to go into the international market. With the mid-range, which is over 25 micron, we produce a number of products, which is pretty exciting because this is where the bulk of the fibre will be. Some of those products are, are socks, which are selling superbly, um, knitwear, which, of which we've produced three runs now, they're selling extremely well. Uh, knitting yarns, which is a new range of knitting yarns, have just come out in eight glorious natural colours. Workwear jackets, where we use a woven fabric, be it all, it's not fine enough for fashion, but certainly is okay for outdoors. Any fibre over 30 micron really is not suitable for touching. It's great for thermal qualities, it's great for lightness. And so we've put this into continental quilts, simply because while they don't handle very well, they still have the exquisite thermal qualities of alpaca, the lightness and the warmth. And the best way to use this is to have it under a cover, so you're not actually touching it, but you do appreciate its qualities. How's the reaction been in the marketplace? Well, it's been pretty exciting. People are responding very well, and probably the best indication of this would be that everything we've produced to date, we've sold, and we're now in our second and third runs of some products. We find that every time we go back to the manufacturer, we're able to improve on the product, so the response is better and better. How do you see the future for the co-op? I see us going from strength to strength. We're getting more and more support from the breeders as they realise that, that sending their fibre to us is investing in the future of the industry in Australia. We're being so well received in the marketplace with reputable manufacturers who want to actually include our products in their range and so put us into their marketing network. I think that the future, the sky, in the future the sky is the limit. From the co-op's point of view, what would be the message to breeders? Possibly to produce the finest fibre they can but to support the cooperative knowing that they will take all of their fibre and use it for an ultimately worthwhile return. They really are fabulous products, but as well as the co-op, other organisations are active. In late 1996, another group of breeders were looking for ways to collect and market the small volume of alpaca then available in Australia. 
AFMO will underpin the long-term success of the industry with that important infrastructure for the sale of commercial quantities of fleece. Why was there a need for a marketing organisation? There was a need for a marketing organisation in Australia for Australian alpaca because most of it was being kept in sheds. There was a little creeping out into the cottage industries and spinning and spinners and weavers. But in the main, if you're going to have a professional industry, alpaca fleece needed to be professionally marketed. How have you gone about educating the industry? AFMO identified three areas that we needed to educate the industry in. This is an industry that has a lot of new breeders coming in that have had very little rural experience. And it's a growing industry, it continues to grow. So this is an ongoing commitment that we have. The first thing we used was a clip care manual. We believe that this is the product, and it is the product from an alpaca, that needed to be handled professionally and properly. The second most important area was in fleece preparation itself. You would understand that the product that we all deal in is fleece. And not dealing with that effectively and properly can cause a lot of damage and lower the price. So we felt it was most important to get the message through to the growers that they had to handle the fleece as if it was spun gold. The third thing we did, we decided that we needed to hold seminars. People needed to understand a little bit more about fibre. We did that in conjunction with the CSIRO. The, the title of the seminar was Lessons from the Wool Industry. It was overwhelming in terms of the education that this provided, not just to new breeders, but to people that perhaps had never actually dealt in fibre before. We had an overwhelming response to the booklet that we produced from this seminar, and we're still getting called for that today. And what are the challenges for the future? Challenges for the Australian alpaca industry are many. But from our point of view, the most important is that we have to find the clip up, we have to produce good quality alpaca fibre in quantity, it needs to be collected and marketed effectively. We've now got international interest from the UK, China, India and now Taiwan. The, the future of Australian alpaca is an, as an international product. This is a product that's highly valued in Europe and the Far East. An Australian alpaca down three or four years from now will be proving itself on the international market as the best in the world. So what actually happens to the fibre you collect? Our growers will consign fleece to Narandra, our facility in Narandra. When it's received in Narandra, it's weighed. That's the first thing we do is weigh it and check the loading bill against the actual weight received. The second part of the process is we would, we would sort it and class it. You have to appreciate that a lot of small breeders send mixed lots of fibre so that we have to carefully separate it so that there is no contamination and then it is classed. From Once it's classed it then goes into its lots and is baled and offered for sale. Perhaps the biggest challenge to developing products has been the lack of facilities to deal with the smaller quantities of specialist fibre. So to answer this need, in 1997, Elite Fibre Australia was formed. I'd be the first to admit that uh, the opening of a factory is not something necessarily that one would call a glamorous event. Not say as glamorous perhaps as a casino or a fashion parade, but in terms of the significance of uh, an industry and industries within Australia, the fibre industry, we believe that will be something that will make a significant difference. This $1.3 million facility was born out of a desire to produce world-class fabric made from our pack of fibre, uh, together with the other fibres that you've heard Cherie talk about, and then to be turned into quality products. The mill has the capacity to take in raw fibre, to be scoured, to be combed, to be carded, dyed and spun into yarn. So we've heard Sherry say this is a one-stop shop for the processing of this sort of fibre. And this mill is probably the only one in Australia that is going to be able to provide that complete service. And therefore it makes it unique and I think it will therefore only gain a reputation with the passage of time. It gives me great pleasure to officially uh, declare Elite Fibres Australia's new processing plant officially open. Thank you very much. Why invest millions of dollars setting up Elite? We've been involved in the alpaca industry for eight or nine years and uh, have a considerable herd of alpacas and a, 
in Australia and quite a large investment. So really the um, culmination of the, of the industry is to move it into the commercial phase and there was nobody in Australia able to process alpaca fibre, uh, any coloured fibres for that matter, from scouring through to um, spun yarn. What did people say about your plans? Did many people think you were nuts? <laughs> Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, there's a common comment that anybody that would get involved in the uh, fibre processing industry in Australia would have to be completely crazy. There's only a few large operators left standing, really, and they're, um, they're operating on a, on a large scale and at very low margins. There was a, there's a niche there for, for an operator doing specialty fibre production in this country. Was it difficult to raise the money for Elite? No, it was actually quite easy because most people knew that they, there had to be something done about the fibre. As things went on, we sought um, other investors uh, in the alpaca industry, large investors who put in between twenty-five and one hundred thousand dollars each, and uh, also uh, the alpaca cooperative has a twenty percent interest in Elite. Are you surprised one of the bigger operators didn't see the niche that you've seen? They're, they're down, downsizing most of them rather than, than um, increasing their capacity, and probably this area is too difficult and a little bit too. Um, obscure for them to bother with. They're all, they're all volume driven, they're, they don't seem to be quality driven. So quality is the key? Well we pay attention to detail. I believe that we, we are capable of producing high quality product in Australia. We are really competing with the Italians and Germans, we're not competing with the Asians uh, in terms of the quality. The, the Italians produce probably the best quality yarns, that's what we're trying to emulate here. This will be a catalyst for the expansion of the alpaca industry in Australia. Nine years have passed since that first shipment. In that time, the alpaca industry has become one of the most promising alternative farming opportunities since our forebears introduced the Merino 150 years ago. We believe the alpaca is the best and most probably the last fibred animal to offer this opportunity. Believe me, they are a delightful animal to farm and our industry is exciting, vibrant and here for the long term. Why don't you visit a stud in your area and join me and other breeders in this fabulous adventure.